Go ahead. Mm -hmm. On evolution of spirit in the unconscious is the beginning. On evolution in the in the ignorance with its play of the possibilities of a partial developing knowledge is the middle and the cause of, of the an, an anomaly anomalies of our present nature. Our imperfection is the sign of a transitional state, a growth not yet completed, an effort that is finding its way, a consummation in a debate in a de deployment of the spiritual self-knowledge and the self-power of its divine being and consciousness is the culmination. These are the three stages of this cycle of the spiritual progressive self-expression self in life. The two stages that have already their, their, play, their, play, their play seem at first sight to deny the possibility of the later consummating stage of the cycle, but logically, they imply its emergence. For if the inconscience has evolved, has evolved the consciousness, the partial conscious, the partial consciousness already reached, already reached, must surely evolve into complete consciousness. It is a perfected and divinized life for which the earth nature is seeking, and this seeking is a sign of a divine will in nature. Other seekings also, there are. Other seekings also there are, and these too find their means of self-fulfillment. Or we draw into the supreme peace or ecstasy, or we draw into the bliss of the divine presence are open to the soul in all the existence. For the infinite in its manifestation has many possibilities and is not confined by its formulations. But neither of these withdrawals can be the fundamental intention in the becoming itself here. For then, an evolution, evolutionary progression would not have been undertaken. Such a progression here can only have for its aim a self-fulfillment here. A progressive, a progressive manifestation of this kind can only have for its soul, for its soul of significance, the, the re significance, the revelation of a being in a perfect becoming. Yeah, so this is the last paragraph of the chapter, The Aim of Life Before Theory of Existence. So he's summing up for us what he said. Okay, so let's have a look. An involution of spirit in the inconscience is the beginning. Okay? So that's very clear. The manifestation of the divine in matter is the beginning of the whole drama of the world. Okay, so the and the stage is being enacted. And what is this play? The divinization of matter ultimately. It begins with a zero and it has to go to a hundred percent. And what is that? We are in the middle now. The matter, which is the inconscious, has already produced life and has produced mind. So there is the middle. We are in the middle of the drama. The drama is yet to end. Picture abhi baki hai, as they say. <laughs> okay, so this is the middle. Okay, so. Now, at the end, he has told you what it is. Okay, you see, an involution of spirit in the inconscious is the beginning, an evolution in the ignorance is its play of the possibilities of a partial developing knowledge in the middle. That is our condition. We have a partial knowledge of matter and a partial knowledge of God because some yogis have already reached. And so man, they represent man. So man has got some idea of what the uh, God the divine is, and some vague idea of also what are the possibilities of matter. Okay, so the middle. Okay. And a person is the middle, and the cause of the anomalies of our present nature. The anomalies of our present nature is all the opposites that are there in the physical world and in man. Okay. We have both. We have, if there is love, there is also hate. If there is kindness, there is also cruelty. If there is good, there is also bad in so many things. Okay, so there is strength and courage, but there is also cowardice. So these are the anomalies of our present nature. These anomalies have to disappear. Our imperfection is a sign of a transitional stage. So this is saying we are in transition. A growth not yet completed an effort that is finding its way, a consummation in a deployment of the spirit's self-knowledge and self-power 
of its divine being and consciousness is the culmination. So, bearing the involution of spirit in matter, then the evolution which is partly done okay, up to the level of mind is a middle and the end will be what he is saying very clearly, a consummation. A consummation is successful completion. Okay? A successful consummation. It has nothing to do with consumption. Okay? May be very clear. So, consummation in a deployment of the spirit self-knowledge. Deployment. Okay? It is going into the physical world and it is being deployed. Just as you deploy an army into different sectors. Exactly in the same way, the divine is deploying himself into the many of the universe. He is one, but he becomes the many in the universe. And that's a deployment. <clears throat> of the spirit's self-knowledge and the self-power of the divine being and consciousness. What is being deployed? The divine self-knowledge and self-power. So, it is the ultimate. Divine's own power and divine's own knowledge is being disseminated in the physical world, but it will be the culmination. The divine power and divine must come here. These are the three stages of the cycle of the spirit's progressive self-expression in life. This self-expression, the physical world, is a self-expression of the divine. Just as a, a painting is a self-expression of an artist, the poem is a self-expression of a poet exactly in the same way the universe, the physical world is a self-expression of the divine. And that self-expression must become perfect. Then it's a culmination. Then he's saying the two stages that have already their play, they have already come into existence, the two stages. Which are the two stages? Life coming and then mind also coming. These are the two stages that have already they play, seem at first sight to deny the possibility of a later consummating stage of the cycle. But logically, they imply its emergence. Now that's an interesting sentence, and let's see what is saying. He's using logic. The two stages that have already they play seem at first sight to deny the possibility of a later consummating stage. What does he mean of the cycle? He means that in life, it is supposed to be life, but it ends in death. Okay? So, how is it? It is full of contradictions. You know? It doesn't seem to, and the death doesn't seem to end at all. Yes, life is coming. He has already told us that there are anomalies. So, the anomaly is life and death. Okay? So, but death is permanent. Birth is permanent, but death also is permanent. So there doesn't seem to be any chance of that ending. That's why he's saying seems to be no chance of the divine and come coming. That's what he's saying. Yes. This. But logically they imply its emergence. So what does he mean by that? If there was no chance at all of the matter producing life and mind, then we can say that there is no chance of a divine mm, possibility of uh, divine life on earth. But it has done that. It has, matter has produced life and has produced mind. So, logically, if it is capable of doing that, it has to go to the last of life. That's what he means by logically, they imply their emergence. Okay? Why should it stop in the middle? That's not reasonable. For if the inconscience, uh, he is explaining, okay, he is giving a reason. For if the inconscience has ever consciousness, the partial consciousness already reached must surely evolve into complete consciousness. It is a perfected and divinized life for which the earth nature is seeking, and this seeking is a sign of the divine will in nature. Now, a very logical person may challenge your view. Okay? He may say, How do you know it will complete? Maybe the, the intention in the evolution is to stop at the midway. Okay? But if it was midway, it could have stopped even earlier. It could have stopped at life. So, so this is logically, it means that it has to go to the end. Okay? So, for if the inconscience has evolved consciousness, okay, the partial consciousness already reached, 
must really be a sign, must really evolve into complete consciousness. It is very logical. It's a perfect and divine life for which the earth nature is seeking. And this seeking is a sign of the divine will in nature. There is a divine will in nature. He has already discussed the four theories, but now he is saying, taking the last theory, his own theory. He is saying it is a perfect and divine life for which earth nature is seeking. And this seeking is a sign of the divine will in nature. This rainbow did. But is that the only aim in evolution? That's what Sri is now discussing. He says, no, not necessarily. There are many others who say other seekings also there are. And they there to find their means of self-fulfillment. With so what are those? He is now receiving them. The first is the aim is withdrawal into the supreme peace and ecstasy. This is the Buddhistic aim. And it's uh, okay. We can accept that she's wasting. A withdrawal into the supreme peace of ecstasy. Okay? A withdrawal into the bliss of the divine presence. So, this is the ananda is the aim of the human soul and the <coughs> evolution in nature. That is one. And the other is peace and ecstasy or ecstasy. The Buddhist theory. And the bliss of the, the ananda. Okay. To get ananda. So, but these are not evolutionary in the physical world. These are different aims. And so we are saying, okay, if that is their aim, that's all right. There are. But there is a problem with those two things. Okay. He's saying withdrawal into the divine bliss are open to the soul in earth existence. These possibilities do exist. And they are okay. They can. A, a, a individual soul may want only divine peace or it may want only divine bliss. So that's perfectly okay with me, he said. But they are open to the soul in earth existence. Now, there is a problem. For the infinite in its manifestation has many possibilities and is not confined by its formulations. Okay? The divine presence is infinite possibilities and why should there be only those only peace and only the bliss, why should it be? Okay. For the infinite in its manifestation, there are many possibilities and is not confined by its formulations. But neither of these withdrawals can be a fundamental intention in the becoming itself. He's saying those who want to go to bliss or peace are perfectly justified at an individual level. But why do you insist that that should be the uh, there, 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 there is no evolution in the physical world, so that then square with the evolution in the physical world. You are leaving the physical world and going away. Okay? But neither of these withdrawals can be a fundamental intention in the becoming there itself. And explaining why. For then an evolutionary progression would not have been undertaken. Why was it necessary to evolve my life and mind? So, if you want to go only from here to the peace and bliss, then evolution on earth is not necessary. That's what should be said. Okay. Such a progression here can only have for its aim a self-fulfillment here. If you have gone halfway, then it is logical to think that it will go fully. Okay. A progressive manifestation of this kind can only have for its soul of significance, the revelation of being in a perfect becoming. The revelation of being, spirit, becoming the physical world. So spirit is going to manifest itself fully in the becoming. That's the end of the theory. That's what he said. So that is his view. And many others uh, may not agree with him, but this is the view that there is an evolution. Don't forget that there is an evolution. If you forget the evolution, yes, you can have other aims. But if the evolution is there, it will reach itself. So that completes the chapter 16. Now we are on to chapter 17. And what is that? The progress to knowledge called man and nature. 
So again, if you see, again we come back to the three poises. God is transcendental, man is individual, and nature is the middle, or right? cosmos. So there you are, you have again, basically you come back to the same idea. So ideas are the same, and they are formulated in different ways. We can start the next chapter, God, the progress to knowledge, God, man, and nature. He has told us that there is an evolution, so now he is looking at the evolution. Okay. If you remember, if you remember, he has told us that he has told us in the, he has divided the life divine into three parts. Na? So the last part is the evolution. He is looking at the evolution. And this paragraph in this chapter is part of the evolution. So we can read. Who will read? Archana Di can read if she has the text. Ah, yes, okay. yes, I'm reading. Go ahead. The progress to knowledge, God, man, and nature. Thou art that, O Sweta Ketu, Chandogya Upanishad. The living being is none else than the Brahman. The whole world is the Brahman. Viveka Chudamani. My supreme nature has become the living being. And this world is upheld by it. All beings have this for their source of birth, Gita. Though thou art man and woman, boy and girl, old and worn, thou walkest bent over a star. Thou art the bluebird and the green and the scarlet eyes. Shweta Shwetara Upanishad. Though, uh, this whole world is filled with beings who are his members. Shweta Shwetara Upanishad. Uh, I stop here, Rangada, or I read the first para? Uh, yes, yes, go ahead. Read the first para. An, an involution of the divine existence, the spiritual reality. One minute, Rangada. Good to eight minute, Anna. An involution of the divine existence, the spiritual reality, in the apparent unconscious of matter is the starting point of the evolution. But the reality is in its nature an external and eternal existence, consciousness, delight of existence. The evolution must then be an emergence. The, the evolution must then be an emergence of this existence, consciousness, delight of existence, not at first in its essence or totality, but in evolutionary forms that express or disguise it. Out of the inconscient, existence appears in a first evolutionary form as substance of matter created by an inconscient energy. Consciousness, consciousness involved and non-apparent in matter first emerges in the disguise of vital vibrations, animate but subconscient, then in imperf imperfect formulations of a conscient life. It strives towards Full, sorry, self finding to successive forms of that material substance, forms more and more adapted to its own completed expression. Consciousness in life, consciousness in life, throwing off the primal insensibility of a material inanimation and nuisance, labors to find itself more and more entirely in the ignorance, which is its first inevitable formulation, but it achieves at first, only a primary mental perception and a vital awareness of self and things. A life perception which in its first forms depends on an internal sensation responsive to the contacts of other life and of matter. Consciousness labors to manifest as best it can through the inadequacy of sensation, its own inherent delight of being, but it can only formulate a partial pain and pleasure. In man, the energizing consciousness appears as mind more clearly aware of itself and things. This is still a partial and limited, not an integral power of itself, but a first conceptive potentiality and promise of integral emergence is visible. That integral emergence is the goal of evolving nature. We have more or less repeated in different words the last paragraph of the previous chapter. He's saying that, but he's going slightly more into details. 
He is telling us the three levels of the evolution. The starting, the middle, and the end. He is saying the same thing in different words. With slightly more details. And in middle, okay, by the way, the uh, quotations are very interesting. Dava, that, oh, Shweta, Ketu. This is from the Chandogya Upanishad. And the Chandogya Upanishad, Dava, that, oh, Shweta, Ketu. Shreemdo says that this is one of the three great formulations of Vedanta. Dava, Tat, Tvam, Asi, oh, Shweta, Ketu. You are that. You are divine in essence. Hardly any other religion or system of philosophy says, dares to say that the human being is divine. Okay? They have a very, in Christianity, they have a very opposite view that man is basically a sinner. Okay? But here is absolutely the opposite. You are divine in essence. That thou art all great to take. Then the other one, Soham Asmi. Okay? That is the second one. Shemdu says there are three great uh, declarations of Vedanta. One is that promise, you are that. Go straight to Second, I am that. So how much me? I am the divine. Okay. And the third one, Sarvam Khalu Idam Brahman. They, everything in the physical world is nothing but Brahman. So these are the three great sayings of Vedanta. Okay, is it? Say the first. The next one, Viveka Churamani. It's a beautiful book, Vivaka Churamani, and it is written by Shankara. Okay? And Shankara is saying here, the living being is none else than the divine. The whole world is a divine. Not only is man, not only man, but living being is essentially the divine, but the whole world also is Brahman. He accepts very clearly Sarvam Kalu is a Brahman. Now if Shankara is saying, that the whole world is Brahman, Sarvam Khalu is Brahman. How can he be a Mayavadin? So he is completely misunderstood. Okay? He is not a Mayavadin. He used the word Maya and he says that the physical world is relatively Maya. But that doesn't make him a uh, Mayavadin. But is he then equal to what Sarvam is saying? No, not exactly. Because he still says that if you want the divine fully, you have to go to the upper hemisphere. So, he doesn't agree. That means to say, at that time, 8th century AD, the idea of evolution was there in essence, but it was not become practical. Okay? So, there is a slight difference between what he is saying and what Shri is saying. Slight in, in a way of speaking. Okay? He said, if you want the divine full, you have to go there. So, Shri is saying, if you want the divine full, you can get him in there. Physical universe, but you have to wait a little bit <laughs> until the evolution is over. But the possibility is definitely there. Okay, so. Then, from the Gita, my supreme nature has become the living being, para prakritik jiva bhuta. That is the sentence. Okay? My supreme being has become the living being, and this world is upheld by it. So, all beings have this for a source of life. Everybody comes from the Brahman. Then the next one, Shweta Ashwadharu Upanishad. Shweta Ashwa. Okay? So the white horse. Okay? Shweta Ashwatara Upanishad. Now this, is, this quotation says that the divine himself has become all the many in the physical world. He is the one, but he has become the many. And what are those many? Dawat man and woman, boy and girl, old and warm. The walk has bent over a staff. However, whatever you see here, even old age, you are nothing but the divine. Thou art the blue bird and the green and the scarlet eye. It's a way of saying in poetry that everything in the physical world is the divine. Then again, another quotation from the Sri Rasvita Upanishad. The whole world is filled with beings who are his members. Here is the quotation. Very interesting quotations. <laughs> Now we come to the first panel. An involution of the divine existence, the spiritual reality, in the apparent inconscience of matter, is the starting point of the evolution. Very clearly, it's almost a repetition of the first sentence in the last paragraph of the previous chapter. Very clear. Okay? But that reality 
is in its nature, what is that reality? He says, no. He says there is nothing but Satchitananda in his nature and eternal existence, Sat, consciousness, okay? Chit, derived of existence, Ananda. This, the evolution, must then be an emergence of this existence, consciousness, delight of existence. So, Satchitananda has come down and involved itself in matter, and the evolution is going back towards the origin. That's all he's saying. Evolution must then be an emergence of this existence, consciousness, delight, evolution, not at first in its essence or totality, but in evolutionary forms, partially, which have evolved. In evolutionary forms that express or disguise it. Now that's interesting. Express or disguise. You remember he said in Life Divine Elsewhere that every stage of the evolution is the unveiling of the divine, but it's also a veiling of the divine, depending on you're coming up or going down. If you are coming up from Brahman downwards, then it's a veiling of the divine, each stage. And that same stage, if you're climbing up from the bottom, it becomes an unveiling. Okay. That's what he means by the sentence. Okay, so depends on whether you're going up or down. Okay, so. But in university form that express that express or disguise it. Out of the inconscient, existence appears in a first evolutionary form as substance of matter. Okay. Substance of matter. That's interesting phrase. It means to say that. Matter and substance are different. Okay. Substance of matter. Matter is this gross thing, but substance can be other than matter also. There are two different things. Substance can be surplus at the highest level. It can be even more dense in the inconscient. So substance of matter. So those phrases, you have to understand. You immediately see why he is saying this. Okay. <coughs> He could have said very clearly matter, or he could have said inconscient. But he thinks substance of matter which makes you think. Okay? It means that matter is only one form of substance. There can be something lower than matter, there can be something higher than matter. Created by an inconscient energy. There you are. So the inconscient energy is creating matter, and then out of matter is again creating life and mind. Okay? So, <coughs> substance is the basic. Consciousness, involved and non-apparent in matter, first emerges in the disguise of vital vibrations. Disguise of vital vibrations. Disguise, it is, what is it disguising? It is disguising soul and also mind. Okay? So it's a disguise. And vital vibrations, the smallest vibrations, okay? unicellular creatures, okay? animate but subconscious. So, very clearly, there are animate forms, subconscious, unicellular creatures also are like that. Then there is also uh, part life and part inanimate and animate. You have the world of, um, of uh, what are they called? Virus? Okay. Virus? Huh? Virus. Yeah, virus, correct. That's right. <laughs> I forget the words. Okay? My age is the virus. Partly acts as, uh, as uh, inanimate matter, sometimes like dead matter, and sometimes like uh, living creature, okay? viruses. So that's a, the go between, between matter and life. Okay? Then he's saying, then in imperfect formulations of conscious life. Okay? So first of all, even the plant is a formulation of life which is subconscious. Okay? Then in imperfect formulations of conscious life. So take a, a caterpillar. It is conscious in a very, very fundamentally, very, very immature manner. It is conscious. Suppose you put your finger, the caterpillar will stop walking, stop walking. Okay? So it is conscious, but very imperfect formulation. Then it strives towards self-finding through successive forms of that material substance, forms more and more adapted to its own complete expression. So you can see from the unicellular creature to the 
worm and the caterpillar and slightly more developed insects, finally small animals, and finally intelligent animals, and finally you have men. So they are the successive forms that is talking about. Forms more and more adapted to its own complete expression. Consciousness in life, throwing off the primal insensibility of a material inanimation and nations, labors to find itself more and more entirely in the ignorance, which is its first inevitable formulation. So, consciousness in life is becoming it is a gradation. So, first of all, it is throwing off the primal insensibility. The first matter is not reacting sensibly to your touches, okay? Apparently, okay? So, primal insensibility of a material inanimation. Inanimation, no life at all, lifelessness. And nations, nations of consciousness, labors to find more and more entirely in the ignorance, which is its first inevitable formulation. Okay. More and more, the ignorance is becoming more and more going towards knowledge. But it achieves at first only a primary mental perception and a vital awareness of self in things. A life perception, which is in its first forms, depends on an internal sensation responsive to the context of other life and of matter. So, he is using very philosophical language. We have to give ourselves examples to see what he is saying. Okay? Then we can understand what he is saying. He is saying, consciousness in life, consciousness, throwing off the primal insensibility, the insensibility of matter is being slowly reducing and consciousness is slowly increasing. In the formula that is giving us, okay? Labors to find itself more and more entirely. Who is finding itself more and more? Consciousness. And where is it doing this? In inanimate matter, okay? So, the, in the biological world, sensibility is increasing and the insensibility is decreasing slowly. You can see the gradation. Okay, so. <clears throat> even plants, okay, even in plants, there is a gradation. First of all, there is a gradation of a plant which is doesn't react to you at all. Then slowly, things like mimosa, okay, that Lajjavati plant, it reacts to your touch. Okay. Actually, plants react to you all the time, but you don't see them. If you love plants, they respond. Okay. You know that there are people who have green fingers. That means because they love plants, the plant also responds and grows very well. By the way, there is a very interesting story which I'll tell you about plants being conscious, but not mentally conscious like us, but there is a consciousness. Mother tells a very interesting story of she was handling a, a vase of roses. Okay? And one rose she was appreciating very much. It's a very amusing story. She appreciates very much. So the other rose which was there, out of, this is the way we speak, human beings. But it may not be like that at the animal level or the plant level. But the, suddenly this other rose turned round and hit mother's hand with its thorn. <laughs> mother started laughing when she tells this story. It suggests a little bit of jealousy. It's not exactly like that, like we interpret it, but it is Mind you appreciating me also. So there is consciousness in plants, we know that. For instance, we know very well that when she was walking in the garden, some vegetables were ready and they were saying, we are ready, you can pick us up. Okay? And there are other vegetables which say, we are not yet ready, please wait. So this is something that not only really mother has seen, but many people have understood that plants do respond. Okay? When I was in the press, um, I printed a book for someone in America, and the, uh, it is a book about plants, okay, and his experiences with plants. Then I told him about mother's uh, experience with plants over the vegetables, and uh, then he put that quotation in the frontispiece of his book, okay. So plants are very, very conscious, but not in our sense, not mentally conscious, but vitally conscious. Okay, so, so this is giving you the gradation.
And then finally, the consciousness in plants become even more. They become carnivorous plants. So you can very clearly see a development in plants from the algae, for instance. Okay, it is not even fixed. Algae just floats in the sea. So from there it goes to a more conscious a plant, like a plants. We gave examples of how they react, and finally even a carnivorous plant. So certainly it recognizes that the insect is um, food for me. And it closes itself and digests the insect. So they very clearly is saying the gradation. Okay, so. <clears throat> so now I go back to the but it achieves at first only a primary mental perception and a vital awareness of self and things, a life perception which in its first forms depends on an internal sensation responsive to the context of other life okay, and of matter. So, two examples responsive to context of other life when man is touching a plant. Okay, some plants also when you touch the leaf they close. Okay, the wisdom tree, for instance, they it closes at night. Even the lily opens at daytime and closes at night. Okay, so there is a response to the light. Okay? So that's what Sam is saying. It constantly is there. A life perception which in its first forms. Depends on an internal sensation responsive to the context of other life and matter. So, other life of matter, just now we have discussed so many, all other life forms are interacting with plants, and then you have this. At the animal level, of course, it is very clear that one life form is contacting another life form, and there is a response. Consciousness labors to manifest as best it can. Through the inadequacy of sensation, its own inherent delight of being, but it can only formulate a partial pain and pleasure. Now, this delight, in it, inherent delight of being, is very interesting. The flowers, for instance, okay, if you think of the beauty that it expresses, so is there not the element of delight in it? They have seen already once that. Three things always go together: okay? beauty, okay, delight, and love. They always go together. So when there is so much of beauty in flowers, there is also delight. It gives you delight, and it's also delighted itself. Beautiful flowers give us delight, but they are also expressing their own delight. Okay, so they are saying the internal sensation. Responsive to the context of other life and consciousness labors to manifest as best it can. By the way, there is a question in English. We would have said in India, consciousness labors to manifest as best as it can. We would have said, but Shem is not using the second as. Okay, in English, okay? consciousness labors to manifest as best it can through the inadequacy of sensation. Its own inherent delight of being is expressing delight. Of being. But it can only formulate a partial pain and pleasure because of the evolution at a middle stage. In man, the energizing consciousness, now that's interesting, energizing consciousness, chit, but also shakti. Energizing is the shakti part, consciousness is the chit part. So chit shakti appears as mind, but mind with an M cap, okay, because he can go above the Mental world also that also mind plays more clearly aware of itself and things. So aware of itself, now the ego comes into the picture. It knows its own existence. Man knows his own existence. Not all, maybe, but most human beings are conscious that they exist separately from others. <clears throat> more clearly aware of itself and things. In the animal world, there is no self-awareness. There is only awareness of what is outside. But in man, you are aware of your own self also. Your emotions and your thoughts are all yours, your inner being. Okay? So you become more aware of yourself. Uh, mind more clearly aware of itself and things. This is still a partial and limited, not an integral power of itself, but a first conceptive potentiality 
and promise of internal emergence, integral emergence is visible. That integral emergence is the goal of evolving nature. So that's the end. So he is telling you exactly what he has said in the last paragraph of the previous one. So he has summed up in more detail. And very interesting details he has given us, which we brought out in our discussions. Okay. So we stop here today, 8.41. So <coughs> this is the way to read Shramdo. You have to give examples to yourself, then it becomes living. Because Shramdo and mother also very often, they speak in general terms, which is truth. But the truth in general terms sometimes difficult to grasp. And if you give examples to yourself, it becomes absolutely living. Okay. So I stop here today. So have a nice day, everybody. Thank you, Rangada. 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 Thank you, Rangada.